What's your view of that, that trip that Biden is making? Well, nothing shows the importance more than showing up, uh, especially if you're the president of the United States. I remember, for example, as we chronicle in the book, when President Bush decided to conduct the surge against the advice of many of our military leaders, and, and I was selected, of course, to command that, he started a meeting at 7.30 in the morning, Eastern Standard Time, with the entire national security team on a Monday morning. This shows your emphasis, your priority. And this act, flying into an actual combat zone or certainly near a combat zone, uh, depending on the hour of the day, uh, is really a very significant statement. Uh, and he also clearly uh, wants to get a personal feel and discuss in person with Prime Minister Netanyahu and his war cabinet, which now includes a leader of the opposition, a very important figure, Benny Gantz, the former Israeli Defense Force chief of staff that I know well and respect enormously, who was then the Minister of Defense, to hear from them um, how they're going about. What you heard in the previous segment is just one of the many, many challenging facets of what is a fiendishly uh, difficult situation. In, in fact, Andrew and I have, have asked ourselves in recent days, is there anything that we describe in the book that is as tough as this uh, for a military commander, noting that, yes, the Yom Kippur War had its mm -hmm. existential threat moment for Israel. There was a moment where Egypt could have kept on rolling if they'd been prepared for the extraordinary success they achieved and the surprise that they also achieved. Um, but in this case, again, the military commanders also are probably saying, OK, boss, we can do this. We can cause enormous damage, inflict enormous damage on Hamas, on the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, but we'd like a little more information on what will follow. A uh, little bit, like again, when I asked mm -hmm. on the eve of the invasion of Iraq, uh, you know, excuse me, could we get a little more detail on what happens after we get to Baghdad and, and topple the regime? And I was assured, you know, Dave, you just get us to Baghdad, we'll take it from there, from the uh, retired generals that were running that particular organization. Um, so I think it's all of this. It's trying to get a handle on what this is an enormous, even worse potential situation than it already is. Uh, if it goes regional, if if Hezbollah uh, enters the fray with their 150,000 rockets from southern Lebanon, um, if uh, Iranian supported Shia militia mm -hmm. uh, might make incursions from Syria or take actions against U.S. forces that are in the region, including in Iraq and northeastern Syria. Uh, again, the potential uh, here is even worse than this extraordinarily difficult situation that faces Israel in Gaza itself, where, of course, it, it, you can't imagine a more difficult tactical mission. Um, if you are to destroy Hamas, uh, and it's very understandable uh, to have that mission, given the horrible, horrific, barbaric uh, actions of Hamas a week and a half ago, uh, which equates, by the way, in U.S. terms, remember we lost 3,000 innocent civilians in the 9-11 attacks. This is well mm -hmm. over 40,000 equivalent uh, for us uh, that Israel mm -hmm. has, has experienced. So going in and doing that, but again, are you going to clear every building, every floor, every room, every cellar, every tunnel? There are the hostages that we just heard about. There are mm -hmm. innocent civilians that Hamas is probably keeping from getting away in some cases. How do you identify the enemy, which doesn't mm -hmm. wear uniforms? There will be improvised explosive devices, suicide bombers. Again, the tactical challenge, as well as this overall strategic uh, component here, uh, just could not be more difficult. And uh, Andrew, I think um, uh, one of the themes in the book is the need to have a very clear goal in, in any military operation uh, for it to, to have a chance of being successful when you assess things from 1945 to, to date. Is that almost the toughest thing at the moment for, for Israel because of some of those challenges that the general just mentioned? That, uh, that certainly is a very important theme in our book. Uh, strategic leadership is absolutely key. You can uh, win wars if you have it, and you can't if you don't, essentially, is what we discovered in the course of uh, researching and writing conflict. Um, and yes, um, the Israelis now have about five or six really intractable problems all coming in at the same time, all interconnected. You, of course, have uh, had that tremendously heart-rending, moving um, 
uh, interview with the cousin of the uh, of the woman who's been kidnapped. But um, but that's only one thing that's going to be on the mind of the top Israeli uh, politicians and and their high command. They're also mm-hmm. going to be thinking about how to actually uh, fight this campaign. Needless to say, it is going to happen. And uh, and how is that going to interact with what um, with the plight of the hostages? They've got to work out how to keep uh, the West Bank, uh, the North. The um, is the actual mm-hmm. Palestinian Arabs in um, Israel itself, and then you have to look at the foreign policy implications with Iran and Syria and so on. So, so this is, as David said, easily the most difficult um, of the uh, of the problems in the Middle East that we write about, and we have written about the Yom Kippur War and the Six Day War and so on. On, on the topic of clear goals, um, General, is it possible that all of this has been well planned by Hamas? Uh, and its allies, and and that this is a trap? It's it's certainly possible. Uh, Again, given the very thorough planning and the creativity uh, that was shown and the operational security, which prevented normally extraordinary uh, Israeli intelligence services from having the indicators and warnings of that attack. But given all of that, presumably they have done the same in preparing for the defense. And so there will be, again, booby traps, mines, uh, rooms will blow up, uh, there will be suicide vest wearers, all of this that ha- that they'll have to contend with, car bombs. Uh, so they are, and, and the, I assure you, the Israeli commanders are keenly aware of all of this and trying to figure out how do you mitigate the damage uh, that is possible? How do you mitigate the losses? But it's inescapable that there will be very substantial losses. Urban combat uh, is consumes infantry, and not just in terms of casualties, but once you clear a building, you actually have to leave a substantial force behind to secure it, or the enemy infiltrates. And so you have to do this progressively. If you look at a situation somewhat similar to this, when the Iraqi security forces, supported by the U.S. and coalition forces, cleared the Islamic State from Mosul in northern New York or northern uh, Iraq, where, by the way, I, my command uh, headquarters was when I was the commander of the 101st Airborne Division the first year of the war, uh, similar size to Gaza City, uh, similar population, and it took them about nine months to do that. Now, Israel knows they don't have that amount of time. Their, their forces are more professional, better equipped, and everything else, but still a very formidable task. And then it, it still begs that question, then what? Uh, Andrew and I have discussed, uh, you know, the the wisdom of offering a real vision for what the West Bank will be. This is what you will have, people of West Bank, uh, when we're done with this operation. Perhaps a vision for the Palestinian people at the same time, um, so that it's not just another case of going in doing a lot of damage to Hamas. You pull back out, and the Hamas political wing is still in charge, and therefore uh, they're just going to rebuild. General, we've got two, two minutes left. One more very quick question for, for each of you. General, first, you mentioned an Israeli intelligence failure. Was it a US intelligence failure as well that these attacks took place in the first place? Well, actually, we depend a great deal on our partners for internal intelligence like this. And this is dealt with as an internal situation. This is Shin Bet that actually does the intelligence for the West Bank and for Gaza. But And there were some indicators, reportedly. There, there have been press reports about it, but nothing mm-hmm. like the precision uh, that normally uh, one expects when these services are normally well upstream, as it's described, in the actual thinking and planning of an operation. Um, And uh, Andrew, the title of the book, Conflict, the Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to Ukraine, release date yesterday, uh, it's almost out of date. You almost have to write a new chapter already. And and my question off the back of that is, are we in the most dangerous time geopolitically around the world since World War II? Well, the interesting thing is that it's not out of date, actually, because um, we've had surprise attacks happen so often, as Paul Wolfowitz said, that uh, the surprising thing is that we're still surprised by them. And so, actually, uh, there are chapters of our book that uh, that cover surprise attacks and what happens after them. And it's extraordinary how much history is a um, important hint and a signpost for the future. I, I, uh, to be clear, I didn't mean it's actually out of date. Perhaps the title is fractionally out of date. Uh, either way, uh, we thank you both for joining us bright and early uh, this morning. Conflict, Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to Ukraine by Andrew uh, and the General is out now.